Welcome to today's episode of Tech Teardown, sponsored by Mauser Electronics, where we look inside two interesting and similar electronics products and provide engineering insights into their components and design features. two USB wall chargers that support two different power levels. We have a 40 watt charger from Ioneus and a 160 watt charger from Nextwell. All right, let's see inside these boxes. Here's the 40 watt charger. And here's the 160 watt charger. Not surprisingly, the 160 watt charger is quite a bit larger than this 40 watt charger. It's about three and a half times larger by volume. According to the online specifications, both of these devices use GAN, wide band gap semiconductor technology. This allows them to achieve the relatively high power densities in these small form factors. Besides the size, the other obvious differences in these two USB chargers are the number and types of USB ports. All four of the 40 watt wall charger ports are for USB-A plugs. The top port supports the Qualcomm Quick Charge QC 3.0 specification. The 160 watt wall charger has three USB-A ports and three USB-C ports. The top USB-C port supports a maximum of 65 watts, while the other two are limited to only 25 watts. Here's a table comparing some of the key specifications. Now, if you're really quick at doing math, you may notice that if you add up all the power available on each port, the total exceeds the maximum power of the systems. 65 watts is greater than the 40 watt limit and 185 watts exceeds the 160 watt limit. So you won't be able to run all the ports simultaneously at maximum power. Now let's take a look inside to see how these products have been engineered. I'm gonna begin with the 40 watt charger. I'm gonna to have to step aside to cut this open so we can look inside. All right, I finished cutting all around the outside of this and now we'll kind of pry it off and look inside. Looking inside, we see a bunch of capacitors here on the outside edges. And just inside them, we have these vertically mounted connectors. This is where the power blades slide in and connect. And then in the middle here, we've got a fuse. Let's take this fuse out. It's in a sleeve here. Inside this sleeve is a fuse for power protection. Right behind where the fuse was located is a negative temperature coefficient or NTC thermistor. The marking on this is 5D-7, means five ohm resistance and seven millimeters in diameter. I wanna pull this PCB out, but we're gonna to have to cut this white epoxy that's been put in there to provide some mechanical stability. On the top of this board, all we see is through hole components. Let's get rid of this epoxy so we can kind of see everything a little better. Right here we see three low ESR, low equivalent series resistance capacitors. These minimize the capacitor losses and increase the efficiency and reduce the output ripple voltage. They're placed right here as close as they can to these USB connectors because that's the output voltage of the USB where you need to control that most critically. While we're talking about the USB connectors, let's flip it over for a second and look on the back. You can see some connections that come through here where these USB connectors are soldered to the back for the electrical and mechanical connections. Right here is U1. Now it is marked SP6639FL. I think it's a DC to DC converter, but I couldn't find a pin out online that matched the layout with four pins on one side all grounded. Over here, the part labeled BD1 is an ABS210 bridge diode rectifier. Here at the part labeled U2 is the SN57CP. This is a power management IC. Up here, the part labeled U3 is a CSC7720 product. It's either a power management IC or possibly a power MOSFET. With a lot of these smaller components, it's hard to find online parts that match the numbers that are on the top code. Sometimes that's because it's not shared because it's proprietary. Sometimes it's because they don't get the entire part number on the product. We also notice there are a lot of holes in the PCB that are not used to connect components, but are thermal vias for heat transfer only. And next, near these low ESR capacitors are these two transformers. And before we finish out this 40 watt charger, I wanna pull out one of these power blades and show you how they connect to the connectors on the PCB. All right, I've pulled out one of the power blades that you plug into the wall on this side. And on this side, it was in the case. There's a little bit of a kind of a hilt to this that helps hold it into the plastic case. Now what happens is these things slide into the connectors on the PCB. What I don't know is why each one of these connectors has two places for this to slide in. 
It could be because there's certain standards that use different spacing. I couldn't find any when I researched it online. Now that we finished up this 40 watt charger, let's transition over to our 160 watt charger. So the first thing I had to do is I took off the stickers off both sides that were covering the edge. And then I've run my knife around the outside all the way around to get this loosened up. And so now we can get it open and see what's inside. Inside the top case here, there's a large metal connection that just glued to the top. This is just for heat transfer. It can help spread the heat from the devices under here out toward the case and, and keep it cool on the inside. There's a little bit of a vinyl or plastic thing. I'm not sure what this is doing, but maybe just keeping it from rattling around from this metal case rattling against this. We've got some thermal paste right here for heat transfer. And now we can see inside all the magic on this PCB. I'm gonna take the PCB out of the case here. I wanna bring back in that 40 watt PCB so you can see the differences between the 160 watt version and the 40 watt version. This one's much, much larger. Not just the PCB, but the components on them are so much bigger. I mean, you got this giant electrolytic capacitor, these big heat sinks here, and much bigger transformers. Now let's look at this one in a little more detail. Working our way from the bottom here, we've got the USB connectors, and again, Right next to them is we have a number of low ESR capacitors so that we get good quality voltage out of the USB devices. We've got some big inductors, transformers here, and then working our way up, again, we've got this giant capacitor electrolytic here, a big transformer, two power FETs. We'll look at these in a little more detail in a second, mounted to these giant thermal plates for heat transfer. Turning this around, we've got the power plug here. Near it, this red device is a fuse, We've got a couple bridge rectifiers and a thermistor. So this negative temperature coefficient or NTC thermistor is marked 2.5D-11. So it's 2.5 ohms of resistance and it's 11 millimeters in diameter. So it's lower resistance and larger diameter than on the 40 watt version. These are KBP-410 glass passivated bridge rectifiers. If we zoom in on this fuse, you can see it's a four amp fuse rated for 250 volts. So now I wanna pry one of these big thermal heat sinks and the attached power MOSFET off. So I'm gonna step aside and get one of those off now. This is an Alpha Omega Semiconductor AOTF600A70FL. It's a 700 volt end channel silicon super junction power transistor and it has a 600 milliohm RDS on. Now that we looked at the front of this device, let's flip the PCB over and see what we have on the back. Interestingly, the small 40 watt board is much more complex on the backside than this 160 watt. The 160 watt version has two large 400 volt EMI suppression capacitors right here. The other large SMT component here on the backside is a part that I can't tell you what it is, but the part number is very similar. It's only off by one digit. There was one on the 40 watt that I also could not identify. Looking at the power plug mount here, in addition to the solder connections for the electrical connections of the AC power, the power plug socket also has two large pins that provide mechanical strength during plugging and unplugging operations. So this might provide a little bit more stability than some of the other devices we looked at. It's really interesting here how these USB components are mounted to the board. The three USB are very similar to the 40 watt, but the three USB-C actually have a PCB mount, their own little PCB that sticks up vertically, and then comes through the board to the back. The solder connections are here on the back. So this provides nice mechanical stability because you have a big PCB coming through it and electrical connections on both sides here. Let's take a look inside a PCB by breaking this apart and taking a look at the layers. Now, if we zoom in here close, we can see what's going on inside. We can see some of the through hole components that are passing through the PCB. So as we conclude, the most obvious differences between these devices is the size. And that's not really surprising because one of them has to handle four times the power. The 160 watt charger is nearly four times larger in volume and four times more power. And then to get rid of all that extra heat, we saw the 160 watt charger had incorporated two very large heat sinks connected to the two power MOSFETs and another large heat spreader inside the case. However, for both products, the use of gallium nitride wide band gap semiconductor technology enables them to provide large power in a relatively small volume. The faster switching frequencies of GAN allow the use of smaller passive components when compared to silicon-based solutions. GAN also has lower on resistance in silicon, which reduces the excess heat generation. These relatively low cost consumer products really demonstrate the advances in GAN technology. This much power in these small form factors would not be possible using just silicon technology. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Tech Teardown, sponsored by Mauser Electronics, as we give you an engineer's look inside interesting electronic products that we use every day. 
Krauser Electronics is an authorized distributor of electronic components from the world's leading manufacturers. For your next electronics project, I would encourage you, head over to mauser.com where you can find helpful design and engineering resources that include a bomb tool, ECAD design library, and a project manager, and much more. See you next time on Tech Teardown.